of years, and um, I most recently received a, a kidney transplant nine months ago, and I'm on the upswing. <laughs> Praise God. Yes. And basically because, you know, my, I had a donor, a wonderful donor, and my donor I've known for a long time, and it was an 85% match, 85% match. And so the doctors wanted to know, was this your, one of your siblings or one of your children? And I said, well, it was actually a white woman from uh, Serbia. And they said, no, it couldn't be because the match is too high. You only had to be 50 something percent to be a match. But this was way up there. And so I think that God um, delivered me through that person. Now, I'm saying this because it reminds me of a particular poem by the great African-American poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. You know Paul Lawrence Dunbar? Yeah. Well, there's a poem that he has called, that he wrote in the, in the, around the turn of the century that's called The Party. And The Party has to do with, um, there were seven plantations that got together and had somewhat of a shindig, the slaves did. And they had, you know, they, first they had, um, you know, um, a great feast. And they had, um, at that feast they had um, all kinds of cuisine. And, uh, and it's narrated by two ladies who are talking across a fence line as they're hanging out their clothes. And one saying to the other one, I wish you could have been there. We had everything, you, I wish you could have been there. And the other person said, she said, I can't stand it. She said, if I'd known you were going to react like that, this is written in, in so-called slave dialect. So I'm changing the tone. She says, if I'd known you were going to react like that, I would have not even begun to tell you the story. But now I can see you're out of control. So the lady said, please go on. And she said, and the slaves, no, and the saints, and the sinners, no. And after they finished eating, the fiddler got up on the floor so they could dance that dinner down. And the uh, Saints and the sinners were so mixed up on the floor that I'm sure God could not have separated them if the trumpets had chance to blow. So that's the whole idea about this, the way that we are connected with one another. We, we were connected in, with, in such a way that it defies medical knowledge, that it defies all kinds of things if God so wills it to be. So I just wanted to, to tell you this because I'm going to show you a film, another very short film about, um, about our museum. This was taken several years ago, but it's give you a little, little clue about uh, some, of the, some of the things that go on in our, in our town of Ash Grove. Oh, hi, How are you, dear? Tiny Museum, the story of slavery, its impact, and 
its legacy in this community. This is a neck For Father Berry, himself a descendant of slaves, it's a very personal story. And this goes through here, and act with the padlock, and that's how they held them secure. And it's a story he wants visitors to understand through their experience here. Can you imagine having this on, moving from place to place? Of course, they wouldn't be this kind. What's well, perfect fit? So this is how a person would be confined. It was a horrible thing. You know, this was this was a, an instrument, a mean instrument that that uh, held the slaves captive. And I also think it's a beautiful thing because I know it held my ancestors. Images of his ancestors cover the walls, but theirs is an uncommon history in this part of the Ozarks, a place many black families fled because of what happened nearly a century ago. On Good Friday 1906, in nearby Springfield, Missouri, a lynch mob swarmed the jail and grabbed three black men accused of raping a white woman. The men were hanged from a tower in the middle of the public square. The white woman who claimed the three black men raped her later admitted that her story wasn't true. But the damage was done and celebrated. Someone in Springfield even minted a coin. On the one side, uh, 1906, Good Friday. And on the other side of the coin, it said the lynching of three niggers. In the days after the lynching, panic spread among black residents, and thousands left the Springfield area never to return. Father Berry's family was one of the few that stayed. Racial animosity continued for decades. And so, when after years of work in Eastern Orthodox churches around the country, Father Berry decided to return to Ash Grove and open his museum, friends cautioned him. My family friends called me here and they said, you know, you better be careful opening up a museum in that little town. The white folks aren't going to like it. Despite that warning, he says the reception here has been warm. Townspeople even helped him clean up his family's cemetery, overgrown and almost forgotten for decades. The tombstone of his great-great-grandmother, a slave, mm -hmm. is barely standing. Many other slaves have buried in unmarked graves here. A few years ago, Father Berry moved his family back into the farmhouse where his grandmother raised him. Nearby, he built this new church. It's no bigger than a single car garage. But within this small frame, he holds to his faith and his quest for racial harmony. In this way, Father Berry hopes to resurrect his hometown's lost heritage of black Americans. I can look back at my ancestors and go, these guys endured, they were slaves and children of slaves, and they were able to live their life and leave behind a loving legacy that people even today appreciate. This nation is my mother's family. Oh, daddy. So that's our new little church there now, which we've even expanded. We have a certain growth, growth spurt now. That's our new church. We have even domes around there now. <laughs> so anyway, my, um, well, I had the occasion to be in uh, St. Catharines, Ontario uh, most recently. And St. Catharines, Ontario is just across the bridge from Niagara Falls. And that's a town where many runaway slaves found refuge in, um, you know, in Canada. And when we got there, uh, you know, I had, was giving a lecture at this library and at some, some Quebec University or something. And so one day they said, well, why don't you come and uh, we'll give you a tour of the city. And they took me around. They took me to a church called the BMA, the British Methodist Episcopal Church. And that's the church where Harriet Tubman raised money for the Underground Railroad. And um, she would, um, she would, there was a podium there where she would preach to 
for help from above and from below to um, help her in the cause of freeing slaves. And so there was a young woman who was a curator, and she was a graduate student from the university, and she was a young African-American lady. And, uh, and I, when I saw that podium, I said, oh my goodness, it's a relic. <laughs> and, those, and those people who brought me there, they were, they were priests, you know, and they didn't know. It's not that they were priests, they just didn't know. And so they started making a little laugh. They thought I was making a joke. And I said, oh no, don't you know what a relic is? A relic is an inanimate object which holds sanctity. And how that happens, we don't know. But God is the one that does that. God gives that the increase. And uh, so, so this is tr truly a relic because Harry Tubman sweat over this, over this podium. And she prayed to God because she was in a church. And that was, that's an old church. She was in that church and she prayed to God and she was, you know, she was not just asking for the help from men because she knew where her help came from. And so that young girl was so moved, she started crying. And she, actually her family owned that building. They had, been, they had been members of that church since the days of slavery. And she called the maintenance man and the maintenance man cut me off a piece of the crossbar from the podium that Harriet Tubman raised money for the Underground Railroad on. And I took it back to the house, and you know, little slivers of this I've been giving to the Brotherhood of St. Moses. So maybe we can find someone with a, a great saw. We'll cut off a piece for you guys here, for your brotherhood here, and uh, to have, you know, as a, as a relic, not something that we venerate as we do St. Paul's chains, but just an, a holy object, you know, a holy object that we can say, aha, that is really something. Because that is what changed America. And there are many people, because we don't know what God thinks, but there are many people who are part of the Underground Road, which I do believe to be saints. And even when I have the litanies that I have, I have um, the, the, in the prayers, that, uh, the vigil, I will say, I will name the saints, Nicholas of Myra and Lasia, so on and so forth, the saints of Kiev, the saints of the Bolshevik Revolution, and the saints of the Turkish yoke, and the saints who suffered under the yoke of slavery in America. So, because this, what do we know about them? We know that God knows, and many people who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And many people who we think will enter into heaven will be the last. I think that's why I was given another couple of years. Because I need some more time, as we all do, to uh, repent. Because especially if you get in touch with who you are and, and how you've been behaving and how you have you just said, I will do as I please because I can. Nihilism. And we don't call it that, we just call it stubbornness. You know, I'm kind of strong-minded kind of guy. Actually, what it is is you're worshiping false god. So, my grandmother, have you heard of a dowry? Of course you have. This is, this is from my grandmother's dowry from 1907. And this is called, this is her, this is her, I want to put this big for you, Matthew, or you, or somebody. Yes. Say what again? Say. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. This is from um, this is from my grandmother. When, this is from her dowry. Yes. When people got married, you know, they would bring something to the marriage. You know, they didn't have WalMarts <laughs> or, or the big stores, so they would bring something. And this is her quilt from her dowry. It's, it's called Mamie's Pattern because this is a this is a one of a kind. You will never see this one again. It's such such a fine piece that. Um, you know, it's just, it's very rare. And we're going to, this is, she's going to also be retired. She, they refer to these as women because they are, um, they are receptacles of a certain sort of holiness. As women are certain sort of holiness, potential receptacles. So, this, this belonged to my grandmother. And she was, she was uh, quite, quite a lady. She was, uh, she was, she was, I guess what they would call a um, um, a new gentry, new black gentry. She was like she was a woman, she was a woman property owner, and uh, she owned at that time she owned 390 acres in Missouri, which has dwindled down over the years 
as a result of the influenza epidemic which swept this country in the, the early teens, early 1900s, or late 1900s. And uh, we had to sell off a lot of our land. We're only left with 190 acres so of the, of the original property. And uh, this is one of her quilts. And I'm going to show this lady over here. This is, go through here. There we go. This is, uh, this quilt is called a double wedding ring. This quilt, it's a quilt top. You know, a quilt has a top and a bottom. And this, this look at her stitches, she was on the other side. And this is, this is uh, called the perfect quilt. People from all over the world come to see this quilt. From Japan, isn't that something? Yeah, and they call it perfect stitches. And this, this was made by Caroline by before the end of the Civil War. Our family tradition says that she did not want to finish a piece in freedom that she had started in captivity. And I'm glad that she didn't, because it does give us a chance to look at her stitches. So if you're really a sewing person, you can come up here a little later and take a look at her stitches. They're perfect stitches. I asked myself, why would a slave take such time to make perfect stitches on a quilt top? They have to be good stitches, or they won't hold together. But they don't have to be like this because it's going to be covered by another piece. Nor does it have to be as beautiful. It doesn't have to be that beautiful. And not only beautiful and functional, Joyce, this is, these are all individual pieces. Yes. From here to here are 11 pieces. And, from, and uh, so this is a great, great piece. I ask myself, why would they make such perfect quilt? I say that the mark of a good slave is not to please your master. But a God, mark of a good slave is to please yourself and to please God. So this is what we do. When we do things uh, in the church, we don't do it because it will make the pastor happy, although he wouldn't mind. <laughs> we don't do things because um, you know, it's, it's, it's proper. My mom would really appreciate it if I got good marks on my lessons. We do it for our own self so that we can be referred to as good slaves. And the slaves in the sense that we refer to slaves when we sing joy of all who sorrow, an intercessor of the offended, harbor of the storm tossed, intercessor of the offended, staff of old age, mother of God on high, hasten we pray and save thy slaves. If we want to be counted as slaves, then we have to do things in secret that no one will see, only God. So this is why I think and I know I did a little bit of weaving, but this is what we call oral history. It was probably her Jesus prayer. Well, it could very well have been. Yeah. It could very well have been because they did use the Jesus prayer. Down in the place, in our, my great-grandparents' other place, my other great-grandparents' place, in Dade County, we had, a, we had a relative named Izzy, Uncle Izzy. I, don't, I never met him. He was gone before my time. But my mom knew him when she was a little girl. And, uh, and Aunt Uncle Mark and Aunt Melinda. And Uncle Mark and Aunt Melinda were slaves, owned by seven masters. And um, Uncle Izzy was a slave, and his, his folks owned the place where the nuns built the St. Pacomius Skeet. And um, there was a big tree out there. He was a preacher. And he would go into, this, to the, into the woods. Have you heard this term, hush arbor? You should know that term, Hush Arbor. And th this is where the slaves would go and pray. And they would go into a wooded area, and they would get a tub, you know, a tub, and fill it half full of water, and they would get around that tub, and because they were so moved that they would shout. And so they would, uh, you know, the, the, the shouting that we do today is mostly always fake. But when you're, when you're a captive and you shout, you say, help me, save me, oh my God. And that's the real thing. And they were standing around that tub and they were shouting in that tub and the master found them out. And the master brought Uncle Izzy to the big tree, which still stands outside of St. Pacomius Ski. And he tied him up and he beat him till his bones were bare. And every time he would come across him with a whip, he would say, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. It made me think of it when you said, Jesus pray. Jesus Christ, and every time he would do it, he would infuriate the master, and he would beat him all the harder. 
And finally, the master became contrite and gave that entire property to Uncle Izzy. And that's how we came to own that. So, you know, the, 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 the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. But, you know, most of our prayers really sometimes, but let me not say our. My prayers are, don't even reach back right here because of the lack of sincerity. So we need to, we need to uh, be more sincere Christian men and women so that, we can, so that we can burn the midnight oil a little bit and, uh, you know, praise God. So this is, this is part, of my family's, uh, part of my family's legacy. My, um, my great, great uncle Harrison, speaking of revisionist history, um, you said you heard of revisionist history, didn't you? Is it the lady? Or? Anyway, I thought the lady behind you. Black lady. Did you, did you, you know about revisionist history? Did you, were you the one that shook your head? Or no. 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 Okay. Somebody back here shook their head about revisionist history. Well, I will tell you this. My uh, great uncle Harrison was a Buffalo soldier. He fought at San Juan. And revisionist history, we have a postcard in our house from, from him to my grandmother. And it's, you know, has all these soldiers. And they're all from, uh, they're all from San Juan, and they've, um, you know, they, they pose for a picture and stamp San Juan or Rico on the back of it. And uh, new revisionist historians say that there were no black troops in um, in San Juan. Teddy Roosevelt did not have black troops, but we know he did because we have a postcard somewhere. We think. Oh. Buffalo soldiers. I'll find it before we leave. <laughs> and uh, so, so we, we know that there are, you know, we oftentimes write history, rewrite history. And we, we think that people are um, different than, than the way we come to uh, look at them. So, my uncle, Bill Harrison, when I find the picture, is, uh, was, was one of those Buffalo soldiers. I believe you. I've read all about that. Yeah, you read about him? I've read about the black soldiers. Oh, good. Well, you know what they're trying to do now, Deborah? They're trying to say that there's no such thing. Because they don't have that, uh, that hard data. <coughs> oh, there they are. There's the black troops with my great uncle Harrison on the end. Right here. It's from a, from a postcard to my grandmother. Uh, in the Spanish American War. My grandmother used to, she was such a great lady, and she used to, she knew all these beautiful poems about, uh, you know, from American history, especially poems by black poets. And one of her poems that she used to, to always um, say to my mother, because my mother, I mean, I gave my mother trouble when I was a boy. I didn't do it on purpose. I was just, as they say about the joy of all who sorrow. I mean, uh, the unexpected joy icon. There once was a lawless man who would go before the icon of the mother of God and say, mother of God, ask your son Jesus to have mercy on me because I don't even want to approach him. Ask him to have mercy on me. And she said, I'll do it. And she said, well, my son said you're forgiven. And he went away and straightway did that very thing which he promised he would not do. So I was somewhat of a lawless man, a lawless boy, youth. And my, my, my grandmother used to always, always say to my mother, this is a, a, a part of a poem from Phyllis Wheatley. Do you know Phyllis Wheatley? Great African-American poet. She said, um, "'Twas grace that brought me," she was referring to me, "'Twas grace that brought me from my savage land." That's somewhat of a, of a it doesn't refer to Africa, per se. It, re it, refers, it refers to a savage lifestyle. Twas grace that brought me from my savage land. Twas grace that taught my benighted soul to understand. And then she addresses the Christians. And my grandmother would look at my mother. She says, so remember, Christian people, even darkies, as black as Cain, not hue of skin, but inside. 
Even darkies, black as cane, may become refined and join the angelic tree. And of course, that's all she needed to be put in her place. And, she, and so they, they prayed for me. They prayed for me. And I say these poems to you so that you can know what our ancestors uh, lived by. Not all of them, of course, but some lived by. They lived by the sense of giving your brother a break because they knew that there were no breaks in this life given to them from men. And they didn't blame the men who took this uh, dignity from them, necessarily, so I've heard. They didn't, they didn't expect it from them. They only expected it from the believers. They only expected it from the believers, and they expected it from their children. And I'm afraid that if we don't, who, who in this group is, a, is an orthodox person? Who in this group is a Christian person? Well, if you don't start sharing and find out about the traditional African-American, and I begin with Africa, tradition of the church, you will miss out on the legacy that our ancestors embraced. Are you with me? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Good. I have to make sure. Dark sunglasses. It's not <laughs> prescription glasses. Um, so, if we don't have that to pass on to them, we're, we're telling them, do as you please. We tell our children, become Christian. That's a good way to live. That's a good way to live. And we think that the Christian way is this modern American way, which is mostly inspired by um, you know, Western European anyway. Not, not bound by the true church. So make sure you know those things so you can teach your children well. You don't want to give them a half loaf. If someone comes to you, your child comes to you and asks for uh, a bread, you will not give them stone. You give them something much more than that. And if you don't give them that, you have failed. If, if they go wild in their life, you will not have failed. Maybe they would have. But if you don't give them that sense of, um, of otherworldly, traditional Christianity as it came from the source, not as we make it up nowadays. And we do make it up nowadays. So that's what makes you a failure. In my town, when I was a little boy, there was a man who everyone thought of as being, um, thought of as being a, you know, a ne'er-do-well. He lived down on the, on the banks of the Sac River. It's a river that runs, it's a small river. It's called the Little Sac. The Big Sac River is, a, is the Indians, Sac Indians. The Big Sac ri river, river is pretty, pretty large. But this, the Little Sac is about the size of this room. And it goes all through this certain part. and comes down by my house, about 100 yards to the, past the woods in my house. And um, he lived there in a little cabin. And you, have you all heard of a movie called um, um, Manhattan Tales? It's, called, it's what they call a race movie. And it stars, uh, it stars um, uh, oh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the great, um, not Paul Lawrence Dunbar, excuse me, uh, Paul Robeson, and um, the great, um, you know, uh, Ethel Waters, and the whole cast of people. And it's a story about this, this man who, who and I won't, I won't skip the story, but I'll tell you this little plot of the story. And th there was an airplane where these people had stolen this money. They had a, a, a bank job that had gone awry. And the, and the, this was in the time of the biplanes. And the old biplane caught on fire, the engine did. So they threw the money out of the window just, to, you know, just so they wouldn't burn even more. <laughs> and down there in the field, there was Paul, Lawrence, uh, uh, Paul Robeson, and, um, and the Ethel Waters, and they were plowing, and it was Christmas time, and they were plowing, and they were saying, Lord, you have, to, you have to help us out. We don't have anything to even give the children this year, and so you have to give us something so we can, something, maybe it's some, to, some fruit or something from the earth that we're plowing. That'll be a nice present, and all this money falls out of the sky. <laughs> <coughs> Paul, 
Robeson picks up the money and goes, oh, Lord, you answered my prayers. I knew I needed a new tractor. <laughs> so he um, and his wife says, no, we get to take this money back to the church, and we have to ask everybody what they need. And if they need something here, then we will give it to them. And one little boy came up and he said, my daddy is a carpenter, but his tools were stolen. So we need to hammer, have a hammer and some other tools. And so he gave him that. And this other little girl said, my little sister doesn't have any warm socks. So I would like to ask for some socks for her. And he went down the line and the money was dwindling, you know. And Paul, Paul Robeson said, well, I guess I'll never get my tractor. And so he, there was a little bit left. And they said, um, you know, we've forgotten one person, old man Moses, who lives down by the creek. And so they went down to this old man Moses. He lived in a shack just like our old man Moses. Uh, his, actually, his name was not Moses. His name was uh, Dad Wesley. And so we went down, they went down there, and they asked him, what do you need? What would you like to have for Christmas? And he said, well, I can't think of a thing. And you can see his house was just... You know, you could just see through the walls, and he was having his cooking his meal out there over a big kettle, and I think it had a boot in there. <laughs> Probably not, but I think that's what it was. But he was just having his little meal right there, and and he didn't want anything. He didn't want anything. And uh, they said, not even, don't you want a new house? Or he said, no. And 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 they were still carrying that coat that the money fell out of, you know. And and they says, well, I guess I could use that coat. And the coast was all full of holes that had been burned, you know. And so he took the lowest part. You know, he did not exalt himself. So he was exalted by the Lord. This old man, Dad Wesley, who lived down by the creek when I was a boy, was uh, the same kind of an old man. They still had those kind of people when, when I was a boy who lived in, uh, lived in, you know, in poverty. And, and just, uh, they just depended on the kindness of strangers and, and, and hunting and living off the land. It was even that way here in this neighborhood, you know. About, I would say 30 some years ago, there was, a, there was a street just down this way, and I don't know the name of it, but it was still dirt road. Can you believe that? It's true. And there was a church on there, and one of the churches were called the, the, the First Hope, the First of the Last Hope, the First of the Last Hope Church. And down the other corner was the Second church of the last hope. <laughs> and my wife and I used to, we used to walk down by that place and we, were, we lived in Atlanta and uh, we'd, we'd just have a chuckle at that. And that's what, that's what he was a part of. So the things that we really think are important and that we really need sometimes, we probably don't. You know, we must put our things, our hope on things eternal and, and hold on to God's unchanging hand because we will miss the boat and we'll be laying there in the bed and, and on our deathbed. And I probably imagine that I've been on one, but, I, but they say I was on deathbed. And I, the only thing I could think of was, I thought, well, I didn't say, woe is, woe is me, woe is my children. I didn't say, oh, poor Magdalena. I didn't say anything. The only thing I thought of was, oh, my goodness, you owe so much. You owe so much. And you have not made amends for the people that you have wronged. So I started making the list. And, uh, you know, I, and there's many that, that, that didn't make the list. But there's some that I did know that, that did make the list. They didn't make it because I didn't remember them. So let's be that way in our desire to serve the Lord and to serve one another. We say oftentimes that we love um, we love the Lord. Who said that? Thank you. I do like the little spots. <laughs> that, that, they cannot breathe it out. Because that's my tradition. You, know, you, you too? <laughs> so, um, you know, we say we love one another. And we say we love the Lord. And we don't love our brother. And you know what Jesus has to say about that? If you say that you love the Lord who you have not seen, face it. And you say that you do not, that you love your brother who you have seen, that you are a liar. 
and the truth is not in you. It's, you do not have the capacity for truth. It's not in you. So if we want to know how we can serve our <coughs> Lord, let's begin by serving one another, who we can see. You know, we always shoot for things too lofty for us. We want to see uh, uncreated light. Some do, some don't. Some want to see uh, all kinds of mysteries that are too big for them, and yet still they won't even take their foot off their brother's neck. They won't even be kind to one another. So maybe it's fake. So make sure we're not fakers. Questions? No questions? Are you from Atlanta? Uh, no, no. I lived here one time. Yeah, I lived here. Um, are you from Atlanta? Chattanooga. Huh? Chattanooga. Oh, Chattanooga. Sure, I know where it is. Did you ever hear of a man named uh, James Bryant? Well, anyway. <laughs> he's, a, he's a famous bluegrass musician. He played with Norman Blake. His name is James Bryant. He's, and he has he a, um, you know, he from Chattanooga. Okay. And he's famous there. Yep. But I live here. My wife and I uh, courted here, and um, we were married here, and uh, then we left for St. Louis. You were a pastor here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. There's a pastor here on uh, the church on um, Park, Avenue. Park Avenue. Park Avenue and something else. It's just a few, few blocks from here. And I met many people who are here have, have known me from that time because we're all on common journey to try and find out where the Lord was. And we looked in the, the mountains and he wasn't there. And we looked in the sea and he wasn't there. And we didn't know that it was still in that hidden and still small voice. So we've, we've been looking for, we're looking for the Lord for a long time. Looking for the Lord. Looking for more than we could understand. Who wants a God you can understand? I don't even want a friend I can understand. <laughs> so anyway, so yes, that's what so I'm from. I'm, I'm from Missouri. I've, I lived in a house that I lived in my my folks' house. That's where I was born. That's where I was raised. And I left home at 15 years old to go uh, something, discover the America, and uh, didn't move back until we moved from Atlanta there. Some 30 years later, no. 20 years later. Father Moses, I don't recognize the lady on this end. Well, this is a little picture here of, uh, were the children still here? No? no. This is a picture of, this is from one of my family, this is from a cup. It's probably from 18, late 1800s, 1860s, 1870s, I don't know. But this is from a cup, that's why it looks distorted, because it's around a cup. And this is the photograph of that. And this is um, Harriet Tubman, and this is Frederick Douglass, and this is Sojourner Truth. Oh, okay. And some of Harriet Tubman's people are buried in our cemetery, namely Mother Charity. When you see those uh, pictures of, of Harriet Tubman sitting beside of a building, and there's an older lady there beside her, and she has a white outfit, that's Mother Charity. Mother Charity is buried in our cemetery as long with many other slaves, whose relatives started to work in the, the Ash Grove Cement Quarry. It's still famous, they sell Ash Grove Cement all over the world. Ash Grove Portland Cement. And they went to work in the, in the quarries, it was a, they were hiring black people at that time, which many places did not. And they were hiring black people. I even have pictures of them in that quarry with, with, with mules pulling the, 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 the limestone out of there. And uh, so, that's, what, that's why she ended up there. She ended up in, in Asheville, Missouri, and she died, and she was a friend of my family, and this lady's name was Mother Cherry. And if you ever come to Asheville, I'll give you a private tour of the cemetery, and, and it'll show you the, the graves. There's one grave called, it's by a man named, a man named um, Reverend Harvey. Reverend Harvey was a circuit rider for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And he used to, have you heard the circuit riders? They would go from one place to another place in a certain region on horseback. And they would get to a place, and there they would, uh, 
they would stay, they would come on a Saturday night, and they would have the, what they call the night watch, night watch service, which we call vigil. And they would have the night watch service, and then, um, so you can see how close we were in the beginning, because we were looking for that true church. Um, and they would ride from place to place. You know this thing where the people say that all these uh, black people, especially preachers like chicken? <laughs> and I'll tell you where it came from. Because they would, they would make a feast for the, um, for the, um, for the circuit rider priest. And um, you know, they didn't have big cattle. Many of them didn't. And many of them didn't have uh, you know, other kinds of, of, of poultry and meat to give them. But they, it, it's pretty inexpensive to raise chickens. So they became pretty adept at making great chicken. So it's really a, a banner of righteousness rather than something that people would make fun of. You know, they make fun of those things. And they make fun of so much of the things that we hold dear that we don't even know how to look at them ourselves. We don't even know how to consider these things. Should I, should I be offended by that? We say to ourselves sometimes. Or should I just embrace it as part of my culture? I and embrace it, I love chicken. <laughs> well, yes, but you're, you're, you're an adult. You know, some people say they don't. My brother would never eat watermelon. Really? Yeah. And I'll tell you why. For that very same reason. We used to have a train. Frisco Railroad used to go right through our town. And once there was a man, they had these big, you know, open cars of uh, watermelons coming from, I don't know, south or somewhere through Missouri. And there was a man who was at the depot, the Asheville Depot. And he pulled a big watermelon off the, the track. And he said, you boys want a watermelon? And I, and I said, yeah. And Charles said, yeah. And the guy said, OK. So he broke it open on the road tracks there, on the off track. And he says, but you have to eat it right here. And Charles was so embarrassed that he, um, you know, he just, it, was, it, was, it was something for him. And he was a sensitive guy. His, his, his name in baptism is Pambo. And Pambo was St. Pacomius' uh, cell attendant. And uh, so, you know, Charles never did, never did like that. But, I, but, I, but somehow I escaped that because I didn't care. But he cared so much about what people, what people thought and how they, how they would, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, now, I don't know how true it is, but what I heard was that uh, the reason why uh, a lot of the black people ate watermelons when they were slaves was that they were uh, perfect way to hydrate them. To do what? At the same time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of I course. Agree. Yeah. Because you're thinking he'd eat the watermelon there and be like, come in a cheap way of eating them and also have to eat them at the same time. That, you know where it came from? Yeah. Watermelon. Yeah. So it's our, if they say they came over in slave boats. So, um, you know, this, this is something that if you want to embrace properly, and I, and I said you want to embrace properly because you know, there are so many elements that are controlled by the evil one himself that tries to turn us away from those very things that could be uh, a benefit to us. Even if you say, how do we feel about ourselves? Well, you do this, you do that, and you do the other. And that's all inspired by the evil one. So, and we think it's inspired by maybe, you know, our disposition or something like that. But it's really by the evil one. We need to know about who we war against. And we do not war against flesh and blood. We, have, we war against principalities in high places. And if we don't know that as part of our dogma, as part of our life in Christ, then we miss it. Because we think it's, it's on us. We think we war, we think our war against flesh and blood all the time. Well, Jesus said he did. And yes, sir. Um, this question is more, I guess, in line of the history that we're talking about. My great grandfather's a hundred and seven. Actually, he was West Indian. He oh. was white. His father was Scottish, and so for me, having that West Indian Hispanic background, I always grew up seeing people trying to pit the experience of African Americans against the experience of people that may have been white but slaves. And I was curious, how can we as Christians, or us Christians, take that history and connect it across the way? Because in my mind, I think about ancient Christianity connected to the African American experience. I'm also thinking about the other camps that may not have, that may have had different shades. Mm -hmm. How do we think about that? Well, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but I want you to tell me how you do it. 
And the reason why is because you are an inheritor of the, the word for, and I'm an old guy, not that old. <laughs> but you know, this is, a, this, this is up to you to be able to articulate these things and to ask for blessing, to have strength to do so. What would you say? So we can start conversation. I guess for me, like I think that sometimes there's so much focus on the shame mm -hmm. that we end up missing people. We miss people like it's the point we say that some from West Indies we think, oh, they have they're not they're West Indies, they look dark, they don't realize that in the West Indies people can look white, mm -hmm. look Asian because they came around the world, mm -hmm. and Africans have different shades as well. Mm -hmm. And if we expand the conversation, then we can see more of those links with how the church was and how people came from the African diaspora all over the world. There was those common chains. And how do we associate that with the acts of the apostles? Right. Because, yes, we came from all, all, all different backgrounds, all places we see in the acts of the apostles at the Pentecost. Right. And so we, we, we almost have to always bring it back to that. Right. We must, or else we just more philosophy, more, more good things, and make I feel a little bit better about myself. Right. So that's what, that's what our jobs are. You know, I was raised with this uh, mentality that says, uh, not many of you heard this, if you're white, you're all right. You've heard that, right? If you're black, get back. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're a mellow fellow. And this became part of the men mentality of, of a whole generation of people. And, and, and they determine who a person is by, um, by you know, the shade that he may have. And so that's, that's you know, what I, how dare I call myself African American when my great grandfather is white. And on one side, my great grandfather on the other side is white. Right. And how do you do that? Because in America, mostly, I don't know about the Caribbean people, but in America, most of us are called, um, we're, we're not Africans. Right. Yeah. We're just not Africans. We're something. We are a people, and we're a dark skinned people. And it's easy to, you know, to mark a box that says you know, African American or something. But that's easier than losing the job by not marking anything. But, um, you know, we, 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 we suffer from it. We suffer from it. And unless people like you step forward and uh, get, some, get trained, if you have to train yourself and, and be able to speak, and don't let anybody tell you that you have no right to speak about certain things in the church. He's respectfully um, challenged them. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. So that's how you must do it. When someone says something to you about this, this hue of a certain saint, which I know you've done with you, you say, aha, and why is it that you always have St. Cyprian of Carthage looking like a, a Eastern European? Right. Or how is it you always have, and even the book, the most famous book that I love the most, Paradise of the Holy Fathers, the lives of the desert saints, mothers and fathers. And they even refer to St. Moses as St. Moses the Indian. That's what, look it up. And so they can't go there. And so my idea, my thing is to, for young people, to uh, not abandon the church, but to inform them. So that's, that's how it has to be. Because if you don't, who will? And, that, and, I, and I used to, I'm the only African-American priest in the Orthodox Church in America. Wait, stop lying. Yeah, I'm not playing. <laughs> I'm not playing. Really? For really. So that means he's his candidate, and you and you, whoever else might be a candidate, you, good candidate. Wait, what? You're the only one? OCA. OCA, African-American OCA. priest. No, you're not the only Orthodox. No, but the Jerome is, but he's right, right. Bulgarian church. He's different church. Yeah. And then, we have a few Russian people who are, and uh, but OCA, and I was the first African American priest to be ordained since 1907, when Raphael Morgan was ordained. Wow! How about that? What jurisdiction was he? The Greek. I went on search of Raphael Morgan not so many years ago. I went to him in Philadelphia, and he established a society called the Society of Golgotha. And he, he was a very smart fellow. And he, he, when he was ordained, he didn't have, they, they sent him to, con, to, uh, to uh, Constantinople to be um, uh, 
um, God is to be ordained. Where's where's the seat of a of a Greek church? Hmm. Anyway, where? No, no. Anyway, they sent him this place, and the patriarch of Constantinople ordained him. He didn't have vestments, so they gave him vestments, and they sent him back for his mission in Philadelphia. And, he, and, he, and I went there. And I tried. I spent a week there, living in different places. And, um, and when I was there, they asked me to um, to give a talk at this African American museum about uh, these quilts. So I went there, and there was a white fellow who was there. His name is, he's an old Russian monk. His name is Father Anastasi. And he was the keeper of the reliquary of, in Jerusalem at St. Um, Mary and Martha's convent. And, and, I, and I had these things there on the table, and I also had a slave tag, several slave tags from my relatives. That's what they, how they auctioned them. And I had my great-grandmother's slave tag from 1858. It says, it's from Alexandria, Virginia. It says, Alexandria, Virginia. The A.G. Brock slave trading house. Strong, healthy slaves. Lot number seven is on the rear side. And father said, where can I get one of those, Father Moses? I said, well, father, you really can't get them. But then, this is America. You can get anything. <laughs> so he says, um, I said, well, what would you do with it if you had it? He said, well, I, I had, he had this, this a weeping icon of the mother of God and St. Anna. And he said, if I had it, I would put it inside of this kiosk, this little case for, with the weeping icon. So it would serve as a means of racial reconciliation. So I had no choice. I had to give him one. <laughs> so he put it inside there. And then time went away. Time went down. And then he died. He said, he told me, I'm going to bring this down to your church. Now he's dead. And this young father, who's a nun, the abbot, abbot there now, Father Sergio, of, uh, at St. Saint, Tegon, Saint called me last winter and said, I've got a, a job here to fulfill. I've got, I want to bring that icon down to you. And so he brought it down there, and I think it aided in my healing, because right after that is when I got my call about the kidney. So, no questions? Any questions, please? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, and then um, you. I was uh, uh, I converted to Greek Orthodoxy uh, a few years ago, you know, and uh, you know it was always my my thing about about the icons was mm -hmm. that it's like it's representative of the whole you know church. Sure. And you know, uh, you know, I talked to Paul Panielli about it. So, Who? You know, Paul Panielli. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, he told me uh, uh, he did a presentation of icons. He showed one of the oldest. Uh, icons of Christ, you know, and he was very dark skinned, you know. Well, after, you know, he said, well, you got light in the bowl of the ears, you know. You got light in the bowl of the ears. Sure, sure. Well, you know. Maybe even our You know, my wife asked me to let the icons, you know, because, you know, I'm not a Baptist. And we used to have this picture of Christ in the, you know, in the sanctuary. And, uh, you look at the picture, it looked like it was always looking at you. you know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then several years, you know, they took it down and didn't have any pictures in there. You know, and I was like, you know, always uh, uh, wondering about that. And I think it was because, you know, the, uh, the, the, the black church at the time didn't feel connected to the pictures or uh, I guess that would be considered an icon, you know. And, and, and uh, if you go to a lot of churches today, they don't have any pictures at all. Right. Of Jesus on the, you know. And they think it's okay. But the, the problem is, and this is, this is my phrase, you can take it. The problem is, is, is in order to know that you can be sanctified, is to know that sanctity is possible in your flesh. And those icons are representative of something beyond this world. So that's how we become sanctified, by seeing something like us. You know, when somebody says, you know, Jackie Robinson, first Negro, black, major league, you know, white major league player. And um, so the kids are inspired. Well, how much more so if we see, and it was an icon. How much more if we see one that looks like us? And that's okay, because they're only props. They're only props. They're things that help us into the kingdom of heaven. 
and, and I don't mean prop is in, in a you know in a condescending way, but there are aids that help us. And so you know, ask that priest. You know, listen, priest. Why don't you? I, I, how can we? How can we raise money to to get an icon? Um, Father Moses knows a, a great iconographer who does the ones in his church, and uh, and there are several other people around who do that. And how can we get that in our church? Because it's going to help out my kids. It's going to help out my 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 friends. It's going to let them know that in Christ there is no East or West, no bond, no free man, no Gentile, no Jew. How can we say that if we don't have see a representation of such things? 